election comes, you decide by majority. Because otherwise, our treaty are useless. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is clear that uh, we, have, uh, we have to, uh, we have to uh, play by our rules. Otherwise, uh, uh, the divide and the, the divide will be b bigger and bigger, and the mutual distrust will be bigger and bigger. We mm -hmm. have to be very serious about our common policy and our common rules, and mm -hmm. not, uh, uh, not uh, dramatize whether, uh, whether we have to implement an issue uh, which has been decided by majority. To Italy, it happens very often. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it is clear that this is uh, one, uh, one very specific issues, but uh, around which we, ca we must build up uh, our common trust. Then I was saying a lack of common culture. It is clear that this lack of common culture that we must absolutely work on. It comes up uh, very clearly on foreign policy issues, on neighborhood, po neighborhood policy issues. It is clear that, I mean, uh, uh, our approach, uh, I mean, it is clear that, I mean, in our continent, you cannot change the border with the tanks. Because we, we, have, we have built up the European Union because we don't want to change the border with the tanks. Mm. And uh, uh, it was very good that uh, we had a unanimous reaction on this, on what happened. But it is also clear, and we have to work on, on that, that uh, uh, our perception of our common interest <laughs> in, the sh in the medium and long term about uh, uh, big neighbors like Russia are very different in, in today's Europe. Mm -hmm. And it is clear that if we do not forge a common culture and a common approach to fundamental issues which are linked to our vital interests, such as I don't choose our neighbors, mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean, then there are many tests. Mm -hmm. Do we manage to uh, forge a common culture or not? Because it is clear that if we do, we can have an impact. If we don't, we will spend hours and hours of difficult negotiation. Mm. And, 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 and then I think that in on all these issues, but to a member state, it is a reality under our... ...whose leader is trying to do just that in Brussels, uh, to change treaties, to, to, to make a compromise, if you like. The Brexit debate has opened this Pandora's box. And w whatever happens, every single country is going to say, you know what, I want this and I want that. And this, this common uh, on anything, from, from milk prices to how to deal with Putin, will... We'll, we'll Erode. I think Britain's shown extraordinary solidarity if you measure it in terms of net contribution. And we, we are the second biggest net contributor. And in gross, in, gross terms, in gross terms, we contribute on 27 billion euros mm. uh, to the budget to the Euro of the European Union. So I think in that respect, we do show a lot of solidarity. And where we <coughs> have a problem is this idea, symbolic thing, particularly of, of the nation that uh, we've seen the limits of it. We've seen it here in this and stretch this idea of, of migrating. But never Russia. Yes, clearly, there was a lot of solidarity shown over the sanctions against Russia, over the annex, uh, up, you know, the insurgency of a sovereign state territory, Ukraine. But now we have this dilemma, and Putin knows this. You mentioned solving the Syrian civil war. We have to talk to Putin to find a solution to uh, what happens in Syria. Clearly, he, mm. if, if it's proved both the Saudis hurt, you know, support, and we need also to talk now to Russia uh, probably Assad's government is part of the solution and not just the problem mm. to stabilize Syria. But I'm not convinced of just Syria alone, because then you have the whole chunks of Iraq where you have to defeat us. But, but, but there are large is, numbers of refugees that can come but our this way. Is, this is my point. I mean, we, we're talking about all these enormous issues, and Britain is making sure Brussels is focused on this, you know, a few sentences in a treaty. I mean, is, is Brexit... It's a distraction because it's a firm pledge made, the pri made by the Prime Minister, and we're going to deliver on it, and I'm going to be campaigning to stay in the European mm -hmm. Union, I'm confident he will get some kind of a package, but I, there's a real risk, and the biggest risk, in my view, is a very narrow victory, one way or the other, mm. and the losing side uh, not putting up and making it work for the country. There's a real risk of what I call neverendums, not mm. just you know, endless referenda, <laughs> one after the other, in Britain and in other countries in Europe, in demanding uh, on these key issues. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a real danger. This is a very unstable time we face. Mm. But, I mean, I have some sympathy for uh, my, my colleague from Italy here, because clearly we do need to find common solutions, but we also have to be very respectful of national sensitivities here. And mm. there's no easy way out of this. And we need mm. to have David Cameron is the other countries who also seek for more opt-outs and more derogations and a more flexible Europe. Mm. Because building a country called Europe, I don't think there is the demos there to support that. I don't see that. You know, mm. I, I happen to be lucky. I speak four or five European languages. I travel. I love your average, you know, it's Italian from the south feels 
totally European and has huge solidarity with a person in the north of England, uh, frankly, is, 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 is an elitist dream at the moment. It may happen in the future, and maybe my language, I mean, English certainly seems to be cementing the way Brussels works. The fact we can hold this conference today in the language of Shakespeare is giving a degree of dialogue which wouldn't have existed even 50 years ago. I think probably, that's because I'm a Philistine <laughs> that, only, that only speaks English. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> you know, it is amazing. Some processes are inevitable, but I think we are in danger of pushing the project too far, and then if we pro push it too far too fast, it could actually break up, which mm. would be tragic. Mm. for peace and security for the future of all our people. A, a stick of dynamite that's now been shoved into the European project, and we, whatever happens, other countries are going to want pieces of it. They're going to want to have similar power to change things, and then we start going backwards in terms of integration. Or can, it, can Europe push on from Brexit, whatever happens? Well, first, I hope there won't be any Brexit. There was no Brexit. We'll see about Schengen exit. <laughs> a vicious cycle as regards the uh, Brexit uh, re negotiation. It's like if Europe was a, a big boat, not the Titanic, yeah, but a big boat, trying to avoid <laughs> many icebergs. <laughs> Prices here, yeah. And, then, and at, the v at this very moment, there's someone coming <coughs> saying, well, I'm a VIP, I'm, uh, I want my cabin refurbished, r repainted. Uh, please, have a look. I have serious problems. This is... <laughs> I strictly well, but talking with uh, his European counterparts. So, of course, they will consider Mr. Cameron, but they are very big. Um, will they be ready, all these heads of states and governments, to do whatever it takes to uh, give Mr. Cameron to London, saying, look at that, I obtained this victory and then you can, we, can <coughs> we can stay in this union. Mm. I'm not totally sure, uh, because we are witnessing a vicious cycle. Uh, whether you like it or not, we have been talking about two crises, the, the Euro area crisis, Greek crisis, not a single penny to, to save Greece. Uh, from uh, um, the refugees crisis, well, not that much solidarity, even if I perfectly know that the UK is doing a lot, including... Camps in, in, uh, in Jordan yes, and Lebanon. Yes, it's perfectly true. It's the reinstallation of the scheme. And we give one billion sterling Germany, in bilateral aid as well. Germany shows the discrepancies between uh, what the UK is doing. And then, in this very... No such solidarity <laughs> from the UK will be ready to do whatever it takes. Mm. And on the mm. other side, I perfectly understand that the image given by the EU at the moment is not attractive at all. Mm. For, for, for British citizens at all, because mm. it's too little, too late, it's tension. So I'm afraid we are in a kind of vicious cycle. And I'm all the more worried that, of course, the Brits will not only vote on the text obtained by, by uh, Mr. Cameron. And, the and, so my, and I tell you from a French experience, huh, because we have had referendum. And the answer given was not on the text, it was a lot on it's the text. It's also very emotional in Britain, I'm mm. afraid. Of course, of course. Reaction, and then yeah. my, hope, my <laughs> last point and my hope is that you will be able, uh, and I hope you will win your campaign, uh, to insist on what was the slogan that of the, uh, the Tory party manifesto, stronger together. Mm. And that's my point, really. If we mm. look at all you have said, the crisis in Syria, Mr. Putin, and I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat huh, the global challenge, of course, we are stronger together, all. and of course, the EU makes sense if the UK is part of the EU, and if we can, thanks to the UK uh, contribution, mm. Germany and all stronger together mm. to address these challenges. But I'm, I hope that will be enough, depending on the text which will be obtained by Mr. Cameron, because I'm sure he will come back to London saying, "Look at that! It is fantastic a text. I obtained the the best I could." I, I don't see him doing something different, but I'm afraid the the question will be. Much, uh, but much broader. And of course, then democracy has its say, and he could get lots of. What about 20 minutes left? So please send your questions in. We've got a few. I'm going to come to them, and also vote in the poll if you could, if you could get your smartphones, iPads, whatever. Um, just we've got one question here, which kind of plays into all this nice stuff. You were referencing the Balkans and 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 uh, economic migrants from there. The question here is. Oh, this is broken. Uh, as the next round of EU accession states and in the geographic middle of the migration crisis, must we change our security strategies in the Western Balkans? I assume that's our, as in the EU's. That's from an anonymous person. I mean, it, it, the way I read... Oh, here we go. It's up here. Um, when, I, when, when I read that, I think, well, you know, anti-integration people will say, 
wait, so the problem is that we keep expanding too fast. I mean, how, this, this is a serious point. How Should the Western Balkans now and their accession demands rise up the agenda because of the migration crisis? Jorg, I'm going to chuck that one to you. Do you think? I mean, I can simply can simply find my life and just quote John Session within the next five years. So I think this sentence will stay. I think what is needed to develop for this group, let's call them all Western Balkan countries, despite the, the differences they, they have and they, they show, is a credible strategy on how they can come closer to the EU <laughs> in a sense that at a certain point of time in the future, they can join. I mean, I've been to all Western Balkan countries in, in the last two years quite a number of times. And if you speak to, to someone in Albania, they say, listen, I want to leave this country because what's the perspective for me? It is more or less identical the situation to how it was the last 10 years ago. And there is no assurance that it will change over the next 10 years. So then you decide you leave for Italy or for Germany or whatsoever. So the point is, what can we do in the short term, knowing that accession will take time and will require efforts from all sides? But what can we do in the meantime to create an economic and social perspective, especially for the young people there? And of course you can do something with, with legal labor migration, but the point is you want the people to stay in order to have a future for, for these countries. Mm. And what we are trying to do, example, it's, it's just a stone in the wall, but it's better than nothing, to establish functioning vocational training centers in Bosnia and in Albania. This is something when you have create an education, then people might... If you bring this up to higher political level, you, you come up with the, the Western Balkan conference that took place recently in Vienna, where I think a good process was started. It dealt with education for the young people, but also with how you foster regional integration. Mm. Yeah, if you look at the network of motorways, it's, there's a huge disconnect between these six countries. Yeah, if you try to fly from Pristina to Skopje, you often fly mm. via Istanbul. Mm. I have nothing against Istanbul, but... <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I would focus on practical projects as part of this Western Balkan process to give a perspective for these six countries, how they can eco economically and socially prosper, given that e full EU accession is quite some time away. Charles, I know you have a professional relationship uh, in that region. I mean, surely it's a good thing that countries keep wanting to... It can't be that bad if countries keep wanting to join. No, I think uh, the EU and, and NATO accession have been the kind of glue which has kind of bound the region in some degree of stability and prosperity and, and is in all, in all our interest because if that, if that rug is pulled under their feet and there is a Brexit and unravelling of the whole European project, there's a real danger of hostilities breaking out in some of those countries. And we have a very fragile situation. Bosnia-Herzegovina is barely functioning as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a country, as a state. Mm. Albania's got internal problems. We've seen, you know, huge protests going on in Montenegro, which was hoping to get its NATO accession invitation mm. uh, in early next year. Uh, Macedonia has its own problems. You've got the huge migratory flows going through some of these countries, and they're all petrified that you know, barriers will suddenly be put up and some of these refugees will stay there and they'll have to deal with the problem. No, the Balkans is a, is, a, is a kind of almost like a case study in what the, the carrot of EU membership can do in terms of stabilizing that region after 15 years ago when you had terrible atrocities and civil wars. And that's one of the reasons that I am in favor of Britain staying in the European Union Balkans if the whole project falls apart. It isn't so much that I think my country will lose terribly by leaving. We may have some economic impact, but it will be 2 or 3% of GDP. But we're a big, you know, uh, you know rich, uh, world-trading, global economy type country. So I don't think Britain will, the roof will fall in on Britain. But I do worry for the unintended consequences uh, in other parts of, of Europe, including the Western Balkans. Mm. And, uh, you know, EU membership is still uh, gives us huge amounts of influence and resources to try and stabilize those small countries. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and we're here in Slovakia. Slovakia has minorities, uh, you know, in Serbia and Croatia. 
Uh, and so far, the countries which have joined, you know, Slovenia, Croatia, have been great success stories. Mm. Uh, but, you know, but the hard problems, you know, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, again, a big issue. We haven't solved that, you know, uh, more than a decade on, although, again, the EU, Pristina, Belgrade dialogue, very helpful, a, a legacy, legacy from Cathy Ashton that was mm. paving the way for better understanding. And I know, and I, I know Slovakia was very key in, in facilitating all of that. Um, but it is, a, it is a potentially fragile part of, the, of Europe which we need to nurture very, very carefully. And, uh, and I would hate to see um, the EU project no longer a source of mm. reform and, 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 and progress. S Sandra, on that point, do you think Europe has to continue to at least give the impression there's open doors to, to, to ensure that the project continues to grow and continues to have momentum? Yes, I do believe that the Western Balkans should join uh, the European Union as soon as possible. On that, I didn't feel any need for the statement of Jean-Claude Juncker, saying, uh, in any case, not before 2019. I, I really, I, mean, I can understand the political reasons in the internal European Parliament dynamics before being voted as President of the European Commission. For the rest, it was uh, on one side useless, on the, on the other side counterproductive, because now we have the problem of giving new incentive, notably to the new generation, but in general to those governments who are struggling to comply with the rule, with the mm. path that is required and is rightly required to join the European Union. So m I do believe that uh, the Western Balkans, the place of the ba Western Balkans lies in Europe. Mm. And uh, I do believe also that uh, this uh, should push uh, uh, to, uh, and we should use the UK referendum, and of course we, we hope it is positive, at the Italian government we are ready to work with the, Bri with the, with the British government uh, in, the, in the negotiation if it's needed to find positive solution, but mm. I think that on one side we have to use the issue of the Western Balkans, on the, on the other side we have to use the, is the issue of the UK referendum to develop a flexibility policy, a differentiation policy within the European Union, which mm. I think that is the only way, the only way forward. Mm. Uh, from this perspective, I mean, because uh, before was mentioned the uh, ever closer union issue. We want an ever closer union. We, uh, we could say that the union is for all, and the ever closer union is only for those who wish so, mm -hmm. uh, would, be, would be already a, a, good, um, a, a, good step, um, a good step ahead. My view, and of course, I don't have any advice to give, and uh, I don't want what I'm saying to be taken as, as an advice. Uh, but my hope, uh, not, uh, not mainly as a European citizen, then as uh, uh, currently member of a European government, I hope that the UK referendum will be used to finally explain to the pre British public the huge benefit of UK membership. Because if, if there is something which has never been done, it is exactly this. To explain to the Brits that it is in their interest, and I already say that it is in our interest, to have UK in. And we will do what we can to have UK in. Mm. But I think that it is a big occasion to clarify the debate and to explain what are the advantages of being as UK in the Union. And in my view, as a politician, we would organize a referendum in being very brave and very open about the concrete advantages of being a member of, uh, of the European Union. Mm. It is clear that the negotiation is important. It is clear that the key issue, and it is a key issue for all of us, the, the key issue also for the forthcoming Slovak president of the Union. Mm. It is an issue for us which we want to use the 60 years of the Treaty of Rome uh, to relaunch the political process, the issue is not uh, the, founding, the founding member states, uh, uh, the, um, this or that group. The issue is how we want to organize the new relations between a Eurozone, which must be deepened from the political, social and democratic point of view, and which must have a fiscal stance as the Eurozone as a whole, mm -hmm. and a, a, in a single market, which we want. With, with UK, we are very committed as Italy, to deepen, to complete, digital single market, services. This is the key issue. Mm -hmm. But this is the key issue. I, I doubt you can, I mean, I put myself in Italy, I wouldn't win a referendum. I doubt that the British voter will vote yes, because, hey, we have solved the relations between the, the Eurozone and the single market. No, mm. uh, uh, no traction at all. A, a very important issue, but well, yeah, it for is... the city of London, but, but not to your average Exactly, voter. exactly. Yeah. So this is why less use, and I say as a committed, uh, not only committee European uh, citizen, as 
someone who is very committed to have UK in the EU. Let's use it to uh, have a good and open debate mm -hmm. on the benefit of being a member of the European Union. And this kind of debate will certainly help also the debate mm. in the continent. Mm. But can mm. I just ask on the Balkans, because you mentioned that you wanted them to join as soon as possible, which strikes me you know, very soon and somewhat unrealistic given the current situation in some of those countries. But do you think there's therefore a need now to re-examine this idea which is gathering a little bit of steam in Britain that we need to invent another category of membership, associate membership, where you have some of the advantages like access to the single market, but you don't have a full, uh, full freedoms of movement of people. Maybe this would work very well in some of the Balkan, Western Balkan countries as a, mm. as a sort of stepping stone, a bit like the EEA was you know, predicted to be a stepping stone to join the European Union. Do we need to be creative in our thinking and come up with new models of geometry for the European Union? Because the one size fits all under the current treaties is extremely demanding of, of, of fragile countries in the Western Balkans in terms of immigration policy, you know, in terms of uh, all sorts of issues to do with you know, their markets, in terms of competition law, uh, state yeah. subsidies and so on. So do we need to think of new, new categories in which maybe Britain would fit quite nicely into an associate <laughs> membership? You know, uh, Brit Brit you know, Britain and Montenegro. You know, but I certainly uh, don't, I don't the like the Norwegian model, that's for sure. I reject that completely, <laughs> but maybe we need to be a bit more Balkans. brief as possible. Sorry. No, to me it is clear that this can uh, can come if we decide seriously to deepen the integration around the Eurozone. Yeah. If we decide so, and if we are clear that we don't want to oblige anybody to deepen its integration, mm -hmm. but we cannot let anybody to veto our willing mm. will of getting into it. If we manage to strike this compromise, mm. I think that by the time the issue of a differentiated membership will, uh, will raise and can also be formalized. To me, it is already a reality now, but if we go towards the direction, can be a reality which would, could need also to be formalized. And in that case, provided that the previous condition is, is satisfied, why not? Why not? Um, we're rapidly running out of time, so I'm going to bring it back to the question here, which was uh, Europe at a crossroads, and remove the question mark. We are at a crossroads, though going straight on essentially is ignoring the crossroads. And ask all, all four of you if you could sum up in, in, in 90 seconds each. Where does Europe go from here? Does it continue driving on, ignoring the different routes it could take? Does it stop and pause, have a cigarette, have a hot dog, whatever, at the side of the road, wait for things to subside, or does it need to take a new direction? Um, Eve, let's start with you. <coughs> well, facing a crossroad, you could take the U-turn. <coughs> I think the only country which could take the U-turn is the UK. Um, I hope it won't happen, but uh, at least the question is raised, clearly to be or not to be part of the European Union. The <laughs> fact that if I look at all the other countries, you have mentioned Poland, mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. taken the example of Slovakia, we could mention Greece, Portugal, France. I don't see a majority of people uh, thinking they're going to take the U-turn. I mean, mm. There are Euroscepticism, yes. There are Europhobia, so people in favour of the U-turn, of an exit to everything. Marine Le Pen is in favor of a global exit, Euro, Schengen, <laughs> European <laughs> Union. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> she won't have a majority support on this point. So uh, U-turn, first option. Then you can have, uh, well, why not a new Eurosclerosis, mm -hmm. meaning now, OK, we made progresses, including in the recent crisis, because there were there was an integration of the EMU, a further integration. York has said that there would be the need to another further integration, I agree, but maybe there won't be political energy enough to do this. Uh, on the refugee crisis, there, w there, is a s there are steps further, for example, the hotspots and something like that, the relocation mechanism, but maybe too much political energy will be used and mm -hmm. then has be have been used, sorry, and then the political leaders, the, the firemen uh, are fed up and then they are other fires to, to take care of, and then, okay, so they don't have energy enough to become uh, architects and to build something, something different. So this scenario uh, is the scenario of what I would call a bigger Switzerland. The EU would, would become a bigger Switzerland, which is not that by, bad, by the way. It's a, a space of stability, relative mm. prosperity, if we compare with the, but well, with no impact at all on the neighborhood uh, evolution and the world affairs. Mm -hmm. So my last and final scenario, maybe not the way out, then uh, not the uh, stop, 
but maybe going further, going up. And it would be, yes, we go further, we have used this crisis, we have faced them, it has created tensions, but still we had, when we were compelled, looking at the world, I think it's really key, setting the agenda, looking at the world. Yes, maybe we could remember that uh, we can be uh, diverse, but we are united. Uh, you, we could spend an hour, and I know I have only 10 seconds left, to, say, to, to stress the differences between uh, a guy from Bratislava and someone from Paris. But seen from Beijing, mm. it's all the same. Mm. And I will conclude by quoting my honorary president, Pascal Lamy, who has traveled a lot, the former WTO director general. He always insists on this point. Seen from Beijing, Mm. a Slovakian and a French, it's all the same, more or less all the same, part of the same European story with the same model combining economic efficiency, social cohesion, environmental protection mm. in a pluralist uh, uh, context. So if we focus on this, the third option, and you have all understood that's my favorite one, not the bigger Switzerland, but the stronger Europe, more united Europe, Mm. Uh, uh, not only reacting to the world evolution, but shaping a bit more uh, the world outside. Jörg, 28 people fighting over the steering wheel. Where, where does the EU bus go at the crossroads? I very much agree with, with Eve's example, but I just would presume that even looking from Beijing, your wine would win. But this is, <laughs> 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 this is a different story. Um, this is fully right. I mean, I think Sandro was the one who said before, we are in recent years very much inward looking. Mm. For a number of reasons, one crisis follows the others and we, we look inwards. Mm. Yeah, we, we, we discuss, has Spain gained competitiveness compared to Germany or to Italy whatsoever? Mm. The point is, what is our position on the globe? Yeah, we Europeans together must be competitive towards the US, towards China, towards India, to whatever. This is what we are a bit missing currently, yeah? And the, the aim is not in, in economic terms that everyone should become like Germany. The point is how can we be complementary mm. in what we are doing and what we are good at and then join forces on the global scene. This is a bit that I want to, to open the debate. In Europe, uh, it's, I think, clearly in, in the European interest that the UK stays but in my view it's also in the UK interest to stay, but that's not up to me to decide, yeah. But, mm. uh, but I mean, it's very difficult if you simply look at the map, how could one assume that the channel is larger than the Atlantic? So it's, uh, for me, it's in the European interest that they mm. stay, but, but let's see. The core to come to a conclusion of the European integration for me, that is the Euro area. Yeah, we have to integrate more. These are the words completing banking union, fiscal union in parallel with the monetary union, true economic union. This is the inner core of integration, which is an open club. Yeah, the Baltics have shown if you mm. are willing and able to join, it's both willing and able, you can join. And this is what we have to pursue. If others don't want to join, that's fine. But they cannot stop the train of the euro area moving ahead. But if you are part of this inner circle, you have specific rights but also specific duties. Yeah, that goes beyond economic issues. It goes up to values and it goes up to the refugee crisis. The euro area is more than, than a monetary project. Mm -hmm. So let me say this here and, and Eva knows what I mean. <laughs> Charles. Well, crystal ball glazing is always difficult, and there are so many unknown unknowns, you know, in the next 18 months uh, when the Brexit referendum will take place, and that's obviously what I'm mostly focused on. But clearly, uh, stabilizing the Eurozone area is extremely important. Uh, somebody mentioned Switzerland. I mean, Switzerland could be heading for a train crash in its relationship with the European Union. In 2017, the bilateral treaties of Switzerland will all be abrogated unless they've sorted out their referendum result on freedom of movement. Uh, that, you know, so, you know, will there be another, I mean, Portugal had an election recently in which we almost had a government which was anti-NATO, anti-Euro and, and what have you, or part of it within the government. So there are lots of unknown unknowns. I'm 
cautiously optimistic that somehow the EU will muddle through and that somehow Brits will vote uh, by a smallish majority to stay in, but I'm not very optimistic. Uh, I will certainly be making a positive case in the practical advantage to the citizen from you know, the end of roaming charges, uh, free health care when you travel abroad. You know, these sort of things which people resonate with, you know, they understand mm. in their hands. Not talking about just access to the single market or you know, Euro caucusing being prevented in the city of London. This is of interest to the economic and political elite, but not to the man or woman at the doorstep. Mm. Things like you know, freedom of movement for students and Erasmus, uh, environmental issues, Horizon 2020, which is of interest to me as a medical doctor, that Britain does very well in terms of science and medical research funding from the European Union, and that's best done at supranational level. Mm. The Ebola uh, fever in West Africa was largely uh, ring-fenced in terms of that border was well controlled in terms of uh, people coming in anywhere into the European Union and being isolated and treated rapidly. Those practical examples I will be trying to sell at the doorstep. Uh, and I'm hoping mm. that people will resonate with them. Uh, the, there will be some scaremongering in terms of you know, potential job losses, disinvestment, maybe Chinese investments. You know.